Welcome to the Startup Grind. So we all know that the general rule of thumb is that nine out of 10 businesses fail, right? It's a pretty accepted startup. In other words, we're all crazy for doing what we do, basically. But um, if you think about it, it's, it's not always that you can actually and literally take one of your failures and turn it into your next successful business. But that's exactly what our, our speaker tonight did. He had a board game company that I'll let him tell you more about, and he pivoted that and turned it into, as it was failing, turned it into a very multi-million dollar tech startup. Sounds like a good story, doesn't it? I say we go for it. Get up on your feet and join me in welcoming <laughs> up to the stage Jeremy Young from Tanga. <laughs> Have a seat. Thanks. All right, Jeremy. So at Startup Grind, we like to get to know a little bit about the human behind the business before we jump into all the business stuff. So let's take a minute and talk about your early life. So where did you grow up? What kind of culture, family, all that type of business? Sure. So uh, I grew up in, in a family of seven children uh, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So that's about 30 minutes from Spokane up in the north. Um, my dad and mom were not entrepreneurial, but almost every single one of our brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, are entrepreneurs. Uh, either have their own businesses or their own practices. Um, and so grew up um, um, with technology kind of being a core. Um, back in the sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher brought in a TRS-80 computer. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember what those were. Um, but they, you know, they had these big floppy drives. Uh, it ran a form of basic and after playing on that and seeing some of the just very rudimentary games, I mean, super rudimentary, as rudimentary as you can imagine, I was completely hooked and uh, it started to take programming classes for summer school after my sixth grade year. And really after that, I, um, <clears throat> my brother had a lot of jobs in high school and he was always able to afford cars and music and all sorts of, uh, of incredible stuff and so I thought man I need to I need to work hard and and eventually I knew I wanted to start my own business so I actually talked my father into um, stopping at a Costco that had just opened up in in Spokane because he commuted to Spokane every single day and buy Tootsie Rolls and gummy worms and so he would buy these in bulk and then I would put them in little baggies and stuff my uh, coat that had all of these pockets everywhere and I would stuff them full of Tootsie Rolls and gummy worms and I'd sell them for, you know, 50 cents a bag or something like that. And over two years undercover cookie and undercover candy selling, I ended up uh, earning a couple thousand dollars. And I bought nice. my first uh, Commodore VIC-20 and then uh, Commodore 64 after that. And, uh, and, and started to program those computers and program games for my friends. And, and I, I, I play piano and, and cello. Um, and so I used it to produce music and then I put the music into the games. And so early on I was very into kind of the entrepreneurial spirit as well as, uh, as um, you know, computers in general and programming. So how would people in high school describe you at that stage of your life? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it was interesting because I, I was somewhat popular but I wasn't in the jock crowd. And so I worked hard. I, during high school I had three different jobs and I was taking piano, cello, um, and I had a full-time girlfriend at the time. So I didn't have Not a lot of time. time. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of time for anything else. Um, but I was uh, student body president of Coeur d'Alene High School, which, um, you know, so I, I think I had some popularity even though I wasn't in the kind of in crowd. And I don't think I really wanted to be there either. I spent most of my time kind of studying and, uh, and programming computers and then was with my girlfriend when I outside of that. Yeah, very good, okay. So as you came out of high school and launched into your career, what was the first direction that you went? So uh, let's see. What college, did you go to college? I, I went, I did, I went to Brigham Young University. Okay. Um, I um, got married super young like most uh, Mormons do, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, my wife Molly, still married, 23 years. Um, and she was just out of braces <laughs> wow. when we got married, believe it or not. She was 18 and I was, uh, um, just turned 22, so yeah, super young. Um, but at, during that time, uh, I immediately got interested in this new thing called the internet, right? I mean, this was back in the very early 90s. And so I first started as a computer 
um, science major and for some crazy reason decided I wanted to go to business school after I graduated. So instead of majoring in computer science, I just wanted to get done as quickly as possible. So I actually graduated in travel and tourism, which is kind of funny, oh, but um, funny. it didn't give me any benefit really, but, um, <laughs> but it got you out of there. It did. It did. Exactly. Um, but during this time, my, uh, one of my buddies was telling me about the internet and how I could get some dial up access. So I, you know, borrowed a bunch of money and got money from my in-laws and we, I bought this $5,000 IBM computer that was just laughable in today's standards. And, uh, and my friend got me connected to the uh, BYU's uh, internet access. And at that point, I started to play around with HTML, kind of like I played around with some of the other programming languages when I was a kid. And <clears throat> I was working for a telemarketing company at the time and they did inbound telephone calls for um, TV ads, catalogs, radio ads. So we did um, Rush Limbaugh, we sold his books and ties, we did Proform Fitness, US Robotics, which was the big modem manufacturer at the time. Um, on and on. I mean, they probably had 20 large clients like that. So I approached Tim Stay, um, this was probably in 93 or 94, uh, about creating a separate company that would create shopping cart systems for our clients. And uh, so that's what we did. It was called Direct Connect. And um, I kind of headed up the division, hired like four or five people. In fact, Matt Mullen, who still works for me today and every single one of the businesses I've ever started, um, was one of our first hires. Yeah. And you've met Matt, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. just recently. And wow. So what year was this? This was 90, 94, probably. Yeah, 94. Yeah, so this was before uh, net, uh, any web browser existed. Mosaic was the web browser at the time. And so Netscape didn't exist at the time. Um, so we were very, very early and it felt very early. Um, but then when Netscape launched and SSL came to be, um, it kind of fit right into our plan of building these shopping cart systems. And so we were one of the first companies to really produce um, you know, a, a functioning shopping cart system that worked and uh, and started taking orders online um, and what kind of like what kind of companies were online at that point not a lot i mean it, you didn't even have people um, talking about like putting a web address on a commercial at the time so people weren't even discussing it it was very very early i was in Coeur d'Alene in the 90s and i didn't hear about the internet till i think 99 or yeah. Oh, so yeah exactly so it's super early but what would happen is you know, Rush Limbaugh would, would, would get on his radio program and say, hey, go to RushTies.com. And our server was just like a 16 megabyte server sitting in Salt Lake City. We were in Provo. And the server would just completely come to a grinding halt. And then Rush would call me. And I'm just this 20-year-old punk kid that didn't know what I was doing. And he'd be screaming at me to get the server fixed. You better get what it, you know, do whatever you need to do to get it, get it fixed. And... Um, so then we'd spend like a two thousand dollars on another sixteen gig, uh, megabytes of RAM, <laughs> which, wow. as you can imagine, it was really really expensive. And so, eventually, kind of made it through that. Uh, Tim ended up selling that company for twenty seven million. Wow. In two, let me see, it was nineteen ninety seven ish time frame. Wow. Um, there was a pivot in the business model where they kind of competed against GeoCities and did a free web hosting model advertising based. Hmm. Um, so it was a big, big hit for, uh, for Tim at the time. And then what did you do next? So I really hated the, uh, bill, the billable hours type of thing because if we didn't have work coming in, uh, we weren't making any money. Sure. But every single month we were um, basically a company called iServer out of uh, Orem, Utah we were giving them a credit card to bill for our web hosting fees every single month. And so I approached them and, and asked if I could start a web hosting company and uh, you approached basically- You a web hosting company and asked them if you could start a web hosting company? Yeah, yeah, I okay. wanted to resell their services. So okay. I wanted, I had a, um, a way of driving traffic uh, on the internet uh, through a friend of mine. And so I said, hey, I, I've got the marketing down you just create a white labeled service. I'll rebrand it. I called it V servers. They were I servers. I know I was very unique. Um, and, and they agreed. And so within, um, I don't know, about three or four months, um, we were driving hundreds and hundreds of signups every single month. So literally the day we opened, it didn't cost me a dime to open the business. Um, and the, the day we opened, we were getting sales. We were profitable from day one. 
Um, and then I moved from Utah to Seattle and brought our two employees uh, with me and uh, Mike Smith and Matt Mullen and uh, just opened up a, we were working out of our house for a little while and then opened up a little shop in Issaquah, Washington on Front Street above this old TV store and working off like a 5,600, um, uh, 56,000 baud shared modem at the time. Um, but, but basically just reselling someone else's services, but it, it, it all intents and purposes, it was our own, com our customers right. thought it was our own. So is this, is this friend that you had in your back pocket, like a wizard or something? Like, do you know what his skills were? How oh, you mean, you uh, oh, so yeah, yeah. So Steve, I, I was teaching HTML at BYU, um, and I get this guy that was getting his MBA in my class and he needed a half a credit to graduate. Um, so he, he had registered windows95.com before Microsoft did. Oh, wow. And so it was a huge website at the time. It was uh, share, shareware downloads, um, drivers, tips and tricks of community, getting massive amounts of traffic. And Microsoft, if you remember, Windows didn't even have a web browser built into it when it was launched. So they weren't even thinking about the internet. Um, so Steve had registered that domain name before Microsoft did. And they didn't even come after it. Um, because it just wasn't even a, a priority for them. Um, so anyway, we, we had so much traffic coming to that website, I partnered up with Steve, and he drove traffic to vServers through his website. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, okay. so it's just a, a cool partnership because without that, it would, would have been very, very hard to scale and grow that business, but we scaled it very, very quickly. Did you, did you do that arrangement as just a straight advertising contract, or did you do No, kind of a again, I, I wasn't very smart um, <laughs> at the time, uh, and so it was a partnership where, you know, it, you know it, it, it's hard to, it, looking back, 2020 vision is so clear, but, but uh, you know, I probably should have structured it a little bit differently. Um, well, that he's happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> very good. Okay, so now we're in Seattle, and how long were you in the web hosting business? So um, we were coming to a point in our business where we were running out of server space. We had a, a server farm in, so anyway, oh, before that, so mm -hmm. iServer was, was giving us all of our server product. And eventually we realized if we wanted to create any value in the business and control our own destiny, we needed to, we needed to create our own technology. And so we, again, didn't have the expertise in-house. We partnered up with a really cool guy named Link Castle, who's still, he just came and visited me uh, last week. But, um, and he and his team had um, web hosting space in downtown Seattle, and he had the technical expertise to recreate the type of environment that our servers were on. So we created our own technology and partnered up with him uh, to make that happen. And so at that point, we were two separate companies, but working together for a common goal. And so um, so in December of 99, Micron Electronics was coming, uh, uh, looking at lots of different ISPs and web hosting companies. They wanted to do a roll up. And um, so they purchased three different companies and what, ours was one of them. Um, they purchased an ISP in Boise. They purchased um, um, Host Pro out of LA, Alex Casarani's company, and they purchased V servers. And so it was a $50 million sale. It was all cash and it closed in December of 99. And so they rolled that up and now um, then they went to, they moved everybody to Atlanta and bought a company called Innerland, which was publicly traded. And now that company was rebranded as web.com. So it still operates, it's out of Florida. It's one of the bigger web hosting companies in the world now. Well, wow, it's probably been pretty interesting to watch it kind of continue on as life as time goes by. So, what did your what did your wife think of all of this adventure? Like, as you've kind of gone from thing to thing, um, was it always just a natural thing? Was your family good with moving around and doing all these adventures, or was that ever a challenge for you? Um, at the beginning, she was pretty frightened because I told her that I was never going to work for anyone, and she <laughs> thought that that was kind of a very scary thought. But I think that once she saw that that things were progressing and doing well, it became a pretty cool part of, part of our lifestyle. Yeah, um, sure. And she's been super supportive over the years. I mean, I, there's been times when I travel two or three weeks out of the month in certain businesses that I've done, and she's been completely 100% supportive. Very nice. So, um, so gosh, I mean, the year 2000 is where we're at, and you've already done a couple of businesses in the internet. So what, yeah. what, what do you do next? Like, did you take a moment to... So in 98, we, we had a problem where 
um, there wasn't a very good way of getting uh, real-time web statistics uh, for, your, um, for your website. So there were companies out there that were just starting to form like Web Trends. And I don't know if any of you remember, but Web Trends was a product that you actually downloaded the log files to your desktop. And then you would run Web Trends on a Windows computer overnight, and it would take overnight to create, depending on the size of your log file. Uh, but by the morning comes, uh, your data's not in real time. It's kind of a rudimentary report. So I had contacted a buddy of mine uh, named Josh James and, and another friend named uh, John Pastana, and they were, they were doing uh, web development at the time. So they created vServer's website for us, actually. And I asked them if they wanted to start a company to do a software as a service analytics company. And it was advertising based. So um, instead of paying for the software service, you would just put an ad on every page that you wanted to track. And then it was real time. So you, you could just hit, the, hit refresh. And, and what, what we take it for granted now is like Google Analytics and things like that. Um, we had a very basic kind of software as a service model where, where it was updated in real time with pretty charts. And it really started to take off very, very quickly. Um, and eventually I ended up getting out of that company, but Josh turned it into Omniture, which was the largest uh, uh, analytics company in the world that Adobe bought several years ago. And so now Josh is out of that and he's doing Domo, which is a big uh, mm. kind of Tableau competitor. It's uh, taking all the data and, and using a dashboard to, to look at data. So yeah, he did, he's, did an amazing job with that company. Very good, interesting. And so how, what years were you in that company? What was that? Which, which years were you in that company? That was 97-ish to probably 99. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. three companies by the yeah. year 2000. So then we, we sell to Micron, my web hosting company, and I get thrown into, I'm 27 years old, I think, I get thrown into uh, running a, a publicly traded company with 200 plus employees and a board of directors breathing down my neck and Wall Street screaming at me. And I had no idea what I was doing. Sure. Um, you know, it's completely different than just doing what you think is best and kind of running a bootstrap company, right? And I absolutely hated it. I had a two year buyout for 20% of the, the sales price and I, um, it was a disaster. Like I, I didn't know how to relate to these corporate people that came in and you know, the way that they treated our employees, said nothing was going to change. And then they flew in their HR team and fired a bunch of people and changed all the policies. Um, one policy, I mean, they bought us right before Christmas and, and the HR director comes in and says, hey, we're not paying your support staff time and a half. Or I think it was double time on Christmas and New Year's. Um, <laughs> you know, right after they told me nothing was going to change. Wow. And so I'm like, well, you know, that's always how we've done it. And they're going to be very upset. And they're just like, well, it doesn't matter. This is how we're doing it. And I mean, just those types of things happen like every month. And by the time a year was up, I was just, I, I just couldn't even function anymore. I think I, now that I know how things work and I'm more mature and, and have so much experience, I could go in there. It, it, it would be a completely different experience. But back then I just, I just didn't know how to even interact with those guys. Sure. And so at some, at one point I just negotiated my way out. Um, and during that time I had a friend, uh, Nablis Francois, he's been a buddy of mine for 25 years and he was working for me at the time. And he introduced me to a bunch of board games. And the, uh, one of the board games was Settlers of Catan, if you guys have ever played that. Mm -hmm. um, another one was uh, um, like uh, Princes of Florence, El Grande, Lost Cities, all these geeky games that come out of Europe. And uh, I was just completely fascinated by these board games, uh, especially Catan. And so I decided that I would just fly to Europe and go to one of the largest game conferences in the world. It's called Essen, Spiel Essen. And it's in Essen, Germany, in October, and there's about 150,000 consumers that, that come and just play games for four days. And it's usually families. That's awesome. Yeah, it's like all board games. So all the big publishers like uh, um, Ravensburger and uh, Cosmos, the, it, they'll, they'll come and set up all these tables, a lot of people that teach the new games. So it's kind of like um, E3 for board games, basically. And so I just flew there, not knowing anybody, not really understanding the business, and just tried to network. 
So I started networking to all the big game designers that actually come up with the ideas. I had networked with the game publishers, with printers, with graphic artists, and just started to figure out how the whole business worked. When was this? This was 2002 to 2003 time frame, right around there. Okay, so pause on this for a second. Did you take like a half a minute of a break between things I did. All, I okay, played good. golf for six checking. months. Okay, good. And, um, I was starting to worry about you there, Jeremy. And I, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I just, I, yeah. wanted, I, I had to be working. Yeah. Okay, okay. So now we're back into board games. And, and what made you decide that you wanted to look at the business side of that? Have you always, had you always liked board games? But when you have six, seven brothers and sisters, right? I mean, yeah, you're, you're, I you play games like Monopoly and yeah. Risk and that kind of stuff. But but I've found that these games, if you haven't played Settlers of Catan, you've got to just go buy the game. You can buy it at Target or get it on Amazon. I mean, it, it combines so many great elements, like there's strategy, there's luck, there's like kind of hosing your neighbor with this robber, there's trading involved, negotiation, and it all is just perfect in this, in this one game. And it looks like it's really complicated, but once you understand the rules, it's, it, I mean, eight-year-olds can play it. And so it's, it's like the monopoly of Germany. They've sold, I don't know, 40 million copies in Europe or something. So it's, it's a huge, huge game. So I actually became friends with the author's son, Guido Teuber. So Klaus Teuber is the author. Mm -hmm. And Guido kind of controls Catan. He's the, and he lives in the United States, and he's my age. And we became really good friends. And so we actually started Uberplay with Guido and then Matt Mullen, who, who's my CMO now, mm -hmm. and created a company called Uberplay. And it was basically taking the best board games uh, from Germany, trying to secure the license for the American and English-speaking markets around the world, and then creating uh, the, the new graphics. Sometimes, sometimes we take the old graphics uh, and producing them in either uh, China or in Germany, depending on the euro was very, very strong back then, sometimes up to 1.5, so sometimes we had to produce in China. So we, um, and then imported them into the United States and they, they sat in a warehouse in Ohio and then we just tried to, I, I wasn't very smart in the way I thought about it. I just thought, man, these games are so fun. As soon as everybody, one person plays it, they're gonna tell everybody and we're just gonna sell millions of copies. And unfortunately it just doesn't work that way in the United States. <laughs> so. Um, I think we've all had those moments in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Where we're like, oh, okay, now what? So, and then, and then after about a year of doing Overplay, my friend Gail DiGiulio contacted me and she was the uh, head of marketing for Wizards of the Coast. So she did Magic the Gathering, she did Poke uh, Pokemon card game, um, and she had an idea that I thought was just brilliant. So she wanted to create a company that um, was a multi-level marketing company. So think Pampered Chef, Creative Memories, Amway, where you have these independent consultants that buy a kit of board games and family entertainment products and then go into people's homes to play. Because really, the struggle that we had with Uberplay, my first board game business, is that um, in order for people to buy a game, they've got to hear about it from somebody. Like here I am telling you about Catan, hopefully you guys go out and buy it because it's a great game. But most of the time you're going to want to play it first. You go into someone's home, you play a game, and, um, sure. and that's how board games are sold. Um, and so she thought, well, you know, there's always a struggle to get distribution and you're seeing it in your current business. Why don't we start a business called Simply Fun? And we raised seven million dollars of venture funding and we started a company that that created uh, when I was there, it was probably 50 different SKUs of games um, and puppets and puzzles and entertainment products. And then we'd put these into kits and, and the, um, the consultant would go into people's homes and play games with families and friends and then they would try to recruit their downline. And it just, we just could not get it to scale. Like, it just would not, it, you know, you think, okay, well, if, if it works with potions, lotions and creams and if it works for um, cooking equipment, I mean, board games and family entertainment products, you'd think that would be the perfect market fit. And for some reason, I mean, it's still operational, and it's, it, but it just hasn't grown. And so this, I, I think the, uh, the VC keeps putting money into it to keep it going. Sure. Um, it's been 12, 13 years maybe since we started that company. Um, and, uh, and anyway, it's, uh, it, it's still operational, but it just hasn't grown. So in retrospect, um, you're talking about two models now. You've bootstrapped some companies and you've worked the investor side of things. So what are your pros and cons or opinions about those different opportunities as yeah. you look at? So I'm, I'm a big bootstrap guy. I, I haven't had the best experience with investors. So with the Simply Fun model, um, 
around the 2006 to 2008 timeframe when the economy kind of sunk, uh, the investor came in and said, okay, who wants to re-up? And the people who didn't re-up, he basically crammed down to 0.001% of value. So he just increased the shares by a million and um, crammed everybody out. And so the problem when you raise money is you really, if, you're, if your business model isn't such that it can survive without money when it runs out, you kind of beholden to the investor, right? And so um, if there aren't very specific details spelled out in, in contracts and regulations, you basically lose your company. And so I think there is a place to raise money and I'm not super opposed to it, but I'd much rather have the freedom to be able to run my company, bootstrap it, get it profitable and run it as a lifestyle business with maybe some sort of exit in the future, mm -hmm. rather than try to go for the home run and raise a bunch of money and miss goals by some reason and then lose control of your company, get kicked out, right? Sure. It's just, for me, I, I mean, Tang is completely bootstrapped. It's been 10 years and, uh, and I control it. So if um, for people that are looking at the, um, the investor route, what would be maybe the top tip or two that you would give them to make sure and you know, do it right or yeah. protect themselves? I think it depends on your goal yeah. because there are businesses that there is the home run option and, and they feel super um, good about raising that $5 million up front and, and hitting really, really lofty goals and really knocking it out of the park. Um, but if you, if you, for me, I feel more secure in, if I were to raise money now, I would definitely make sure that I never lost control of my company under any circumstances. And I would want an investor that trusted me, said, okay, this guy's done this numerous times. I'm just going to sit back and when he wants advice, I'll call him, uh, board meetings once a quarter where we can get advice and just let me run my business the way I need to run it. Um, if, and then I'd want smart money. So for example, with Tanga, I would love an investor that knew how to um, do SEO or SEO. It does say they have investment companies that they already work with that are really good at driving traffic or they have you know, um, ad networks and things like that that can bring value outside of money. Because right. I could go get money right now, but I would want that extra um, support in other areas that, we, that are a little bit hard for us just because we're so cash um, strapped. Right. Right. So I think if you're going to look for money, look for the right personality fit. Don't let them have control of your company if things um, don't go as planned because they probably won't. And then uh, get the smart money that's going to add a lot of extra value outside of the money. Uh, I know so many uh, entrepreneurs that just get so excited. They, they get someone interested. They get onerous terms. They, um, you know, the guy doesn't offer any value or outside of the the paycheck or the money into the company and then things don't go as planned they miss a quarter or two and then eventually they're out and so I, I just will never let that happen to me sure okay so at this point we have a warehouse in Ohio full of board games so what happens next okay so we tried for about three years to um, create distribution channels for the board games and so we we'd set up booths at Toy Fair and we'd go to the hobby game shows like Gamma, I um, can't remember the, the name of the other one, um, and, and then just pounding the pavement trying to get stores to carry the board games. Now it was easy to get the hobby stores and the comic stores and the geeky stores to carry product, but it was very difficult to get any major distribution. So just so you know, in the hobby market, if you sell 5,000 copies of a game, they consider that a huge success, right? Wow. And so um, for for us, that just wasn't going to work. I mean, I, I wanted to, it was a very creative and fun business, but I wanted to make some money at it. So we would meet with <clears throat> Barnes and Noble and they, they'd be like, oh, we have room for maybe 10 different types of games and I don't know your games and it's got to have a proven track record. We'd say, well, this, this game won the game of the year in Germany and it sold 2 million copies in a year. Um, but they just wouldn't be interested to take that chance. And then it, you can imagine what Walmart says, right? Or Target. Yeah. I mean, they're like, okay, you produce uh, half a million copies of the game, distribute it to all of our warehouses. You know, if they don't sell through 10% in a week, you're going to take them all back. You're going to give us advertising, mm. half a million, a million dollars in co-op advertising. I mean, it's just on and on and on. 
And so at that point, we tried some online distribution uh, methods. A lot of people are having success in, in hobby games right now, doing the Kickstarter route. So they, they sell a lot of games up front um, that didn't exist when we were there. And uh, you know, mobile mobile games um, it, were just kind of getting started. So there was kind of there, there might have been that option if I would have stuck with it a little bit more, kind of moving some of the board games to mobile. But even then, there hasn't been that much success other than Catan and Ticket to Ride. Um, and Ticket to Ride, has anybody played that game? So that was supposed to be my game. Alan Moon sent that to me. Um, I still remember, I can vividly see that prototype box sitting on my desk at home. And I went on a family reunion, it was gone for a couple of weeks. And when I got back, I took another week to play it with my game group and everybody loved it. Called Alan, I said, Alan, I want your game. He's like, oh, I just sold it to Eric Hotman from Days of Wonder. <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I think uh, Days of Wonder sold like 10 million copies oh, of, <laughs> of Ticket to Ride in all its iterations. And they just sold their company to Asmodee. Oh, man. Um, yeah, so it's just unfortunate. It was a great, great game. I still love it. Um, so anyway, we couldn't get distribution. And so I just decided that I <clears throat> was sick of losing money and I just, I wanted to shut it down. Okay, so? So <laughs> I um, had always envisioned, there, um, back in probably 2004 timeframe, American Express had this really cool thing that they did at Christmas. And you would, American Express holders could log into their website and they would offer every single day some killer deal. And it was anywhere from expensive jewelry to trips to BMWs and the prices were insane, like 90% off. So you could buy a BMW for a couple thousand bucks, right? And, but you had to put in your credit card number and be the first person to hit the buy button. Um, so very limited quantity, super incredible prices, and you can imagine, I mean, you would go to, I mean, it was impossible. People were probably writing bots and scripts to, to hit that buy button. I, I tried to get it, all this stuff, and I never ended up getting anything. But the thing is, is that it, it drove huge amounts of traffic. I, millions and millions and millions of people sitting there trying to buy these products. Um, and so during that, after that, I thought, man, that's a pretty cool business model. Take liquidated products, um, sell them for very, very cheap prices and try to drive traffic uh, through that model. Because I knew there, there were a lot of people like me that had inventory sitting there that they needed to get rid of. So they can either sell it for recycling, right? Or mm -hmm. they can sell it for pennies on the dollar or they could try to get some sort of value out of it. And so for me, I, I created, again, I, I, I didn't know how to drive traffic to that particular site. So I teamed up with a, a site called Board Game Geek and Scott Alden. And, uh, and Dirk, they were the owners at the time. And believe it or not, they were getting just a tremendous amount of traffic. Even mm -hmm. now, I think it's, the Lexa rating's like in the four or 500, it's insane. Yeah. And so, um, so I teamed up with them, and then I contacted one, one of my old board game designers, Aaron Weisblum, and he created these really cool puzzles. And so we thought, okay, if we could create puzzles to drive traffic to the initial business and have a new puzzle every night at seven o'clock that people compete and then have forums to talk about it and then they get points and get these little icons for how well they, they've done their puzzles. If they're first, they get more points if they're a hundredth. Um, and then Borgen Geek was driving all of these, these gaming geeks over to our website. And so every night, we weren't selling anything. We didn't even tell anybody what we were doing. But we had a new puzzle every night. And then we ended up getting uh, 25,000 users or something signed up. And then on the last day, the 30th, we launched uh, a product and a puzzle. And so uh, that's kind of how I got rid of all my inventory. Because I just I had hundreds of thousands of pieces of inventory sitting in a warehouse. And, and so over the, the next four or five months, I, I just liquidated all my inventory and, and started generating uh, that traffic to my website. And then what we figured out is that the people love the puzzles. So we ended up creating frameworks for different types of puzzles, because the puzzles were super hard. Um, I couldn't figure them out. I mean, it's like way above my, <laughs> my pay grade. So we decided to, to do a bunch of easier, smaller types of puzzles and then let people create the puzzles. So eventually, within a couple of years, we had like 50,000 puzzles and millions and millions of solves. And, um, and our, our website was a little weird because we had the, this e-commerce side of things, but we had this puzzle side of things, and it just didn't, it didn't fit very well. Um, <laughs> sure. And we tried to keep things, both of them, going for a long time. Uh, eventually, we, we opened up new channels, so we only did one deal a day. 
And that kind of sucks when you put a deal up and no one wants it. No revenue for the day, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have something really hot, I mean, you can sell a couple thousand items, right? And so we decided to open up new categories and new channels. And so we did magazines, we did electronics, um, jewelry. We even tried home goods like furniture. That didn't work out very well at the time. Um, and so eventually we got to the point where we had like six different deals that would launch every night in different categories and we had these puzzles. Um, and I really was running it as a hobby at that point. I wasn't taking it too seriously. It was, um, I was helping friends liquidate inventory. I had some drop shippers. I would buy, I would, I'd love to go to Vegas to the trade shows and make the deals and buy, buy inventory and ship in my warehouse. And, um, but it really wasn't until I had a pricing mistake on a magazine. I think it was supposed to be like fourteen ninety nine, and I forgot the one. I sold it for four ninety nine. I was still oh, making wow. money, but I sold like I can't remember five thousand subscriptions in twenty four hours. And at that point, I I realized that I had a product problem uh, and a pricing problem because I had a ton of, of people that were willing to to press the buy button and a and a pretty decent brand that we were building. And so that was probably six years ago that that happened. And at that point, we were doing about a million dollars in revenue. And, um, and so I uh, moved down to Arizona about seven years ago and opened up an office above the Apple store in Santan Village mm -hmm. and started making strategic hires to grow the business. And so that's when I brought Matt. So Matt was at Simply Fun that we had started together. And then I brought him to Tanga, moved, made a move from Seattle to Arizona. And and really started to grow the business and hiring the right C-level executives to make this all work. Um, and now, with all of our businesses combined, we're at about a $40 million run rate this year. Um, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, we're still growing. You know, as you get as you get bigger, it's a little bit harder to grow at huge rates. But, of course. you know, average over the past six years has probably been about 30% a year. Um, this year, we'll probably be around 20. And how did you survive? I mean, there, obviously, as the economy tanked, um, deal sites became really, really valuable to people, but as things leveled out a little bit, a lot of deal sites just died. Yeah. You know, but you guys have been able to keep your sure. foothold there. So. You know, I, I think they they're, they were just stupid, right? I mean, <laughs> well, they, that must be it. <laughs> they, raised, they raised a bunch of money and hired hundreds and hundreds of people and um, and spent $250,000 on a day on a Facebook logout screen to drive customer acquisition. Huh. And when that money disappears, you're gonna go out of business, yeah. right? I mean, you're gonna be in debt, you're gonna have tens of millions of dollars in debt probably at that point. Um, I, for me, it just it, you just have to be smart in the way you grow your business. Um, and so way, the way I look at it is everybody loves a deal. I don't care how much money you're making. Right, if you could be making a million dollars a year, and you still want to go into that Ferrari dealership and talk them down from three hundred thousand dollars to two hundred and eighty. Sure. Right, yeah. and that's a great deal on that particular mm -hmm. Ferrari. But it, but you also have the mom who's trying to make ends meet. She's a single parent. You know, she wants to buy a five dollar present for her kid, and she could get a five dollar gift shipped to her from Tanga that's a thirty or forty dollar value. Right, and everybody doesn't matter how much money you make, they want a deal and it's just part of human nature. And so it doesn't matter if the economy's doing well or if it's doing badly, um, our company continues to grow. I mean, it does better when the economy is down um, because people want to save more money. And you know, I think we're kind of in one of those cycles where we might see, see some uh, hurt in the economy. Um, at least it feels that way. Um, I think we're kind of seeing some bubbles in certain areas that might pop. Sure. And I've been I've seen that over the past 20 years, uh, three times now, four times now. Yeah. So, and I think it's cyclical. It happens every three or four or five years. So we'll, we'll see. But um, for us, the, what we've really tried to do differently now is, is we're, we have over a million products on our website. So we, we've teamed up with a company called Channel Advisor. And Channel Advisor is a software as a service platform. It's publicly traded out of North Carolina. And a lot of e-commerce companies or vendors put their inventory into Channel Advisor, and Channel Advisor creates the ad listings for multiple marketplaces. So yeah, you have one platform, it'll make a listing for Amazon, eBay, Sears, Newegg. Now Tanga is one of the marketplaces that you can press a button and have your product listed. And so our goal is to have the kind of non-negotiated products that are in the marketplace 
have the front page negotiated deals that are always just like killer prices, best of website, huge margin, um, stuff that we curate and negotiate for our customers. And then <clears throat> use technology to match the right product to the right person at the right time at the right price. So we want to find out as much as we can about our users to be able to um, really create that personal relationship where we curate deals specifically for each one of our users every single day. So well, yeah, so that's our goal. Yeah. It's a lofty goal, but um, we've got some cool kind of proprietary technology we're working on to be able to do it all. And now, um, last question: What well, the logistics side of things? I mean, supply chain doesn't sound like something that was in your background necessarily. So, did you hire people to take care of all that for you, or were there any challenges in having a product for this company this time? Yeah, you know, that's that's one thing that I. I don't know if it's if, if it's a curse of mine or a, or a blessing, but I kind of jump into things without knowing exactly how it's all going to work. Yeah. So in when we first started the company, we had a warehouse and trying to figure out the logistics of packing right. and everything was kind of a nightmare. And then we did it again in Arizona when we moved down here, and it was just it was a little bit of a disaster. I mean, people were stealing from us. <laughs> um, the one Christmas I remember this was probably four years ago maybe five years ago, um, the packing slips weren't printing correctly, so it print the first two or three items of an order, but if they ordered 10 items, the seven were not on the packing slips. <laughs> and so it was just a complete disaster. And uh, at that point, when we brought in our CFO about three or four years ago, one of the first things we decided to do is figure out how to get rid of the warehouse. And so we have a 3PL that we use for product that we purchase or manufacture overseas. Um, we do a lot of opportunity buys. And so the product either goes to Reno or Connecticut, um, depending on where it's coming from. And so they handle all the logistics, they handle all the loss, theft, and, and just the management nice. of that. And we've saved millions of dollars. I'm sure. um, <clears throat> but really, 80% of our business is drop shipped now. So it looks like it's coming from Tanga. It has our name on it, it's got our packing slip. Um, but we work with thousands of drop shippers uh, around the United States and pretty soon around the world that will ship directly to our customers. And, you know, it's not Amazon time frame, but you are getting a lot better deal. So, you know, you, if, if you find the same product in Amazon, maybe five or $6 more, some people say, oh, I just want it tomorrow or the next day. So they'll pay that extra. But I think uh, that's not necessarily our market. You know, we want the, the people who are looking for that deal and will wait to, you know, four or five, 10 days, depending on where it's coming from uh, to get that product. Okay, and why that one was the last question. I heard that a honey badger gave you problems once. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, you got to be really careful if you're manufacturing your own stuff. So we had a, one of our websites, it's uh, lolshirts.com, and we, you know, when the honey badger don't care video came out, um, we did a shirt just like everybody did. I mean, every single t-shirt company out there had a honey badger don't care t-shirt. Well, uh, you know, apparently this guy ended up getting like a trademark on that on that name, and so he ended up suing everybody that that uh, <laughs> you know, like forty or fifty different companies. He was just a, he was a, a little bit of a troll, right? Turns out honey, honey badger does care. Honey badger does care. <laughs> All, right. All right, very good. Well, we're gonna do some Q and A in just a minute, so think about that, my friends. But before we do that, we're just gonna play a little game, a little game called Twenty Questions Rapid Fire. So I'm gonna give you a choice, and you tell me which one. First one, cats or dogs? Dogs. Beer or wine? Wine. Sushi or tacos? <laughs> tacos. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Favorite app? Oh wow, TripIt. Favorite operating system? Uh, Mac. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Favorite car? Ferraris. Favorite vacation spot? Tuskegee. Favorite book? Pillars of the Earth. Favorite movie or TV show? Oh, wow. Um, Game of Thrones and Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> That's diverse. <laughs> Favorite artist or musician? Um, you know, I'm, I'm really in the country right now, so... Um, I know Sam, Hunt. Sam Hunt's Sam? pretty good. Sam Hunt? Mm -hmm. All right. Your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> I, I have never sung karaoke, so I don't even know one. What? I haven't. Okay, I'm going to make you pick something, though. It's but we did, we did have Neon Trees. Um, does everybody know the lead singer for Neon Trees? 
Tyler Glenn. He came and sang karaoke at my house at a party about a month ago. Very and cool. so all of our friends and my wife are singing karaoke with Tyler, but... That's cool. Yeah. You'll play the piano, I suppose. Yeah. All right. Anything to collect? Um, do I collect cookbooks? Hmm. Any unusual skills or talents? Hmm. Unusual? I can speak ob. So, uh, ob is when you put a vowel sound in front of every, I mean, an ob in front of every vowel sound. So, my wife and I used to speak it to each other so our kids wouldn't understand. Uh, but eventually, my three year old McKenna, she all of a sudden started speaking ob to us one day and we're like, what in the world? So, look, give me something to say. So, this is Stabar Taba, Grabein, Gabo Apple, Faber Abba, Shabba Novers, Faber Novex. Wow, that's so good. our whole family can speak that to each other. That's good. That's good. That is an unusual skill or talent, but it definitely qualifies. So, what would you say your top strength is in business? Um, allowing, not micromanaging, allowing people to kind of control their own destiny and own work. What profession, other than those that you have tried, would you like to attempt? Um, chef. All right. What is the best compliment someone can give you? Hmm, that I'm empathetic, I guess, and kind. The cause you are passionate about? Um, LGBT rights. And one thing on your bucket list? I'm going to go to Iceland. Oh, yeah. very cool. All right, so that is all my questions for you tonight, sir. Well done, thank you. Um, we are going to turn it over to the audience to see. So anyone have a question for him tonight? So earlier you mentioned uh, that you don't like board meetings or raising capital and losing the control with the investors. Like during 1997 or 2000, you did raise capital and it turned out to be a nightmare. So what's your advice or suggestions for like entrepreneurs like us who are raising capital and we know that we don't want to keep away more than 50%, but at the same time, you are praising like in different rounds from angel to say to series A or B. And by the time you reach like series A or B, you will end up losing control. How do you recommend that? Yeah, I don't I don't think you can, right? If, if that's your path, um, you're you eventually you're going to lose control at some point. It's uh, and, and in the environment now it may come sooner than later. Uh, just because it's a little bit harder, I think, in the environment today to raise money. So I think for me, if I were to raise money, I would raise probably one tranche, give up like 20, 15, 20% of the company, don't lose any control, make it so I couldn't lose control, use that money to double or triple my company and look for an exit. Um, that's, that's probably, if I were to raise money, that would be my goal. Because then I, I kind of shoot the moon a little bit and what the valuation could be in the next two or three years. Um, but not give up control. I'd, I'd have to lose some of my lifestyle a little bit over the next two or three years until you have that give and take. Um, but that's what I would do. Uh, can I ask, uh, how do you compete with like uh, big websites like Amazon.com or eBay? You mentioned that you have a niche where people are looking to save five to six dollars. But for example, there are so many people like who knows Amazon, but doesn't know uh, your company. So sure. how do you like, create your own marketplace and differentiate yourself? So we've done really well with affiliate marketing. So because we offer the best deals, the best price points by a good margin every single day, that we have hundreds of affiliate sites that will list our deals. And so it's one of our bigger customer acquisition strategies. So I don't know if you go to Slick Deals or Brad's Deals, and these are huge, huge websites. I think Slick Deals in the top 100 Alexa. Right, so they'll list our product. They listed one today on the front page and drove, I can't remember, a thousand sales or something in one item. And so a lot of those people that come in are new customers and start marketing to them afterwards. Yeah, Philip? You mentioned uh, uh, when you went away from your warehouse, you mentioned uh, 3PL. What, what is that? The third, um, third, oh, okay. third party logistics provider. Sure. So yeah. your drop shippers, they do handle fulfillment or they ship to this? They most of them handle their own fulfillment yeah. and will blind drop ship for us. Right. Um, but some do not have that capability. So we'll say, okay, we'll sell this product for forty eight hours, and then we cut a PO. They ship it directly to our 
our 3PL and then it gets turned around very quickly. Okay. So it's not the best scenario. We don't love doing that um, because the, it's not a good customer experience to wait for two weeks to get a product. Right. Um, and so we, we would prefer to have it either in our warehouse ready to ship or drop ship by a, a partner because it can be turned around in a day. For your affiliates, do you use an intermediary like CJ or do you go have a team that goes direct? So we have affiliate managers um, and we do use Commission Junction. In fact, they were just at the Commission Junction show in Santa Barbara last week. Um, but we also have our own in-house platform as well. So we've developed our own and our largest affiliates are on that platform because it saves us so much money. What are some of the best lifestyle habits that are going to set you up for success, whether it be outside of work or inside your own work, so that way if things go bad, you can keep going, or just so that way you're kind of happy no matter what? Yeah, that's something that I had to learn personally is when things go really, really wrong, is to just basically push through it and, um, and try to be positive and know that I have the skills to, to continue to build things even if companies go wrong or something happens. Um, for me, it is getting up early, um, you know, exercise program, eating, I eat the same breakfast every morning, which is green juice with a handful of spinach and uh, some strawberries and protein powder. And I, I have kind of a consistent plan every single day, you know, looking at my calendar, preparing for meetings, um, some of the things that as a CEO that I think are important uh, is building a really strong culture. And I gave a big culture talk at, as a keynote in Phoenix Startup Week. Um, was it this year? Last year. <laughs> and it, I think building a culture uh, is super, super important where people can um, thrive and be able to work on their projects, be the CEO of their own position without a ton of micromanagement, right? And the problem is when you hire people that are not good cultural fits, it brings the entire business down. Because what happens is people spend most of their energy worried about these people, talking about these people, how things aren't working, and it just creates this uh, negative energy within the company that just makes it so you can't grow and you can't innovate, you move super slow. And so part of our core values is um, move, move fast and accept uncertainty. And I think that for an entrepreneur nowadays, especially if you're building things on the internet, you have to iterate very, very quickly and, uh, long, and improve your product in very incremental, small ways. Instead of planning this year-long project that's gonna take you know, millions of dollars and then you're gonna just all of a sudden launch it. But what we try to do is have incremental progress in all of our core products every single week. Uh, and accept the uncertainty that sometimes, you know, our head of sales isn't gonna know about something or our head of marketing isn't gonna know about something, you know, because you can't have that, um, every single person in the company know every single thing that's going on. <clears throat> and so our core value is move fast, accept uncertainty, know everyone is trying to move in the right direction. And I think that's a huge, um, something that every single entrepreneur needs in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you developed a certain regimen over time of how you learn about business? Like, for example, do you read a lot? Do you uh, enjoy mentors? Or do you just prefer to go out and do it and figure it out? Yeah. Um, so I'm involved in a group called EO, which is Entrepreneur Organization. And so there's 160 of us in Phoenix, and we're kind of a mentor group. Uh, I just spent four days with my particular forum of 10 people in Utah and Park City last week. And so we kind of mentor each other with business issues. Um, but I do read a ton. So anytime there's a, a new business book that, that someone that I respect, uh, that I follow on Twitter, for example, will mention a book, I try to download that and read it. So I read, I don't know, six or seven books a month. Um, some of that's just for fun. Um, I, I just got done with a book about, it's called The Billionaire's Vinegar, which is about these, uh, this guy that was a, a big wine distributor and seller back in the 80s and 90s that ended up forging all of this amazing wine that he said he found uh, from Thomas Jefferson's era and he was selling it on the market for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, <laughs> and so um, ended up fi finding out that all this stuff was counterfeit. And the 10%, 20% of the high-end wine market even now is counterfeited. Um, 
which I find is fascinating. And it's not a lot, not a lot of things you can do to stop it, which is, which is pretty incredible. So I, I do read for fun, but I do read a lot of business books as well. Um, and I think there are blogs out there. Um, if you email me, I can send you some of the ones that I follow that kind of talk about new trends or growth hacking. Um, I really like kind of growth hacking blogs and figuring out how to bootstrap your marketing efforts. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the EO organization, right? But uh, I did some research and they only select the companies once you have like quite a million dollars a year. Uh, do you recommend any companies like currently our startup is between about 100K to like 200K a year and we are still not there? Yeah, so EO, it's a million dollars minimum and then you have to be accepted in by the board. Right, so even if you hit the million dollars, sometimes you're, you're not accepted. It's gotta be the right company, the right personality fit. But they do have Accelerator, and that's $250,000 to a million dollars in sales, and then you can join the Accelerator program. I don't know of any groups other than things like this in the community that are that are for people that are doing less than 250000 The Startup AZ organization is, the foundation, I'm sorry, is looking at trying to do stuff like that for the earliest stages of the startup community, so we'll keep in touch. Yeah. One more question? Yeah. So you, you've described yourself as kind of a, a hands-off CEO. How, how is your, your company organized? Is it functionally or divisional or you know, matrix? Uh, have so, you changed that over as you've grown? Or? Yeah, it's kind of evolved naturally and organically to what we have now. I don't, I don't know if we have the best structure right now. Uh, we've got a CFO, a CMO, and a CTO. I'm the CEO. Um, and then we have a bunch of C-level executives, director of operations, director of kind of the merchandising and sales, um, customer service director, affiliate manager. And so we probably are a bit top heavy for our size, um, but we're hoping to grow into that. Um, and so I, I would probably prefer a more flat organization and maybe we'll evolve to, to become more flat as we continue to grow. So you're just kind of product driven then, yeah. As the as products come in, you kind of group them up and then slice them into the, the different organizations or the departments. So, so basically, the way we the way we run is we have specific we call them movie posters because our graphic artists create these amazing movie posters, mm -hmm. taking real posters and then changing the graphics a little bit to what we want to accomplish for the next three weeks, kind of as projects. And so, those projects are what our company focuses on for the next three to six weeks. And we have okay, okay. three to five of them on our wall at a given time. And then once we accomplish those things, they go into the break room. So our break room is just covered with movie posters of things we've accomplished. And so th that's what takes up 60% of our time. The 40, other 40% of the time is just kind of um, you know, just normal work and fixing things and having meetings and, and things like that. Perfect. All right, well, thank you, Jeremy. Let's give him a hand, you guys. <laughs>